Here we go, chapter 17. It was late summer in South Africa. More than a month had gone by since Martine had first met Jemmy, and in that time, her life had changed beyond imagining. Not that it had been easy. After her flight from the secret valley, nine agonizing days had passed before she caught so much of a glimpse of the white giraffe. And then it had been so dark and the vision of him so fleeting that she sensed he was there rather than she saw him. Naturally, her grandmother had chosen that very evening to embark on an all-night session with the game reserve accounts, and there was absolutely no chance of Martine sneaking out undetected. She just had to sit in her room and fume. By the tenth day, she was ready to tear her hair out. It didn't help that ever since the incident at the Botanical Gardens, the Five Star Gang had tormented her. It put chocolate on her chair so that when she stood up, she had a brown sticky mess all over her uniform. It happened at 9 a.m., which meant Martine had to spend the rest of the day being snickered at by the whole school. She found witch scrawled all over her books, and on another occasion, she opened up her pencil case to find a hairy baboon spider, an African tarantula, and I'll get pictures in the comments, perking inside. <clears throat> Martine screamed so loudly that Miss Faulkner immediately banned her from speaking for the rest of the day. <clears throat> Not that that had been very difficult. After what had happened at Kistenbosch, a few kids talked to Martine anyway. The Five Star Gang had turned them against her, and men to whom she would have liked to speak remained a mystery. He, When he passed her on the way to class, his mouth curled up at the edges as if he was happy to see her, but he never spoke. Even after he rescued her, he hadn't said a word. And at recess, he no longer sat under the far tree in the playing fields, but took him, but took himself away to some unknown location. All these things were conspired to make Martine feel tearful and lonely again. And even though she was getting along much better with her grandmother, with the white giraffe gone, the emptiness she felt after losing her mum and dad had returned. What if Jemmy was caught in a snare? What if he too was gone forever? Oh, why hadn't she spent time trying to teach him some sort of signal so that she could call him? She scoured the books in her bedroom and in the school library for more information on giraffes, hoping to learn something that might help her out. But the only new fact she came across was that of, that called Romans had called the giraffe, um, meaning camel marked like a leopard, which was interesting, but of no use at all. Then out of the blue, she had a brainstorm. It happened when she came across a book on dogs on her bookshelf. In his youth, her grandfather had apparently been a very fine dog trainer, and there was a jade box on top of the cabinet in the living room containing three of his old dog whistles. In a rare moment of sharing, her grandmother had told her that one of the whistles was completely silent to the human ear because it was pitched at a frequency only dogs could hear. But what if giraffes, giraffes could hear it too? That night, Martine crept into the garden and experimented with the silent whistle. For nearly an hour, she blew and blew, but nothing happened. Martine stood shivering and frustrated under the mango trees, convinced that she'd never again see Jemmy. Then, a miracle. The white giraffe came striding out of the darkness and stood beside the skeleton tree. Martine did a double take. She'd imagined seeing him again so many times that she wondered for a second if she had conjured him up. But he was real. Not only that, he was looking right at her, just as he had done on the night of the storm. Martine didn't even pause to check for lions or leopards. She just went tearing through the game park gate and running and stumbling along the waterhole track, sending all manner of night creatures fleeing for their lives. When she reached the giraffe, he lowered his head and she flung an arm around his neck with such enthusiasm that he snorted with an alarm and backed off a little, even though he was obviously just as pleased to see her. Jenny, said Martine, thanks for coming back to me. In her fantasy, she's always followed this moment by hopping on the white giraffe's back and being whisked away to the secret valley. But in real life, Jemmy was an untamed animal as tall as your average tree and Martine knew as much about training wildlife as she did about riding a unicycle on a high wire at a circus. 
so there was one or two practicalities to overcome. She found, for instance, that there was really such a thing as beginner's luck. The first time she rode Jimmy, he stood quietly beside a tree and allowed her to climb onto his back. This concept seemed to have vanished from his mind entirely. Now, when she attempted it, Jemmy waited until she was uh, suspended between the tree and his back before spying some juicy acacia leaves and then moving away. Martine had improvised a sort of flying dive and latch onto his neck. There, she dangled until her arms nearly came out of their sockets. At that point, she stumbled, she tumbled a very long way to the ground. Jimmy didn't understand what he'd done, but he made his low musical fluttering sound and nuzzled her with his silver nose until Martine forgot about the pain in her backside and remembered how much she adored him. I have to be patient, she told herself. She also tried to put herself in his position. If she were a giraffe and someone rubbed the back of her forelegs and tugged gently on her knees, she figured that eventually she'd understand that they'd want her to lie down. So she experimented with Jenny, and after some trial and error, he did. And before the night was over, Martine was flying through the moonlight again on the back of the young giraffe. That was only the start of it, though, because she then had to learn to steer Jemmy and stop him. It didn't happen overnight, and there were several close calls over the next few weeks while they got to know each other. Once the giraffe shielded away from the bristling porcupine, and Martine nearly impaled on its black and white spines, but through it all, Jemmy was gentle and loving. When he did grasp what she was trying to teach him, he grasped it completely, and he'd always known it. And I'll make sure to include a picture of the porcupine as well. For Martine, it was then that the door opened on the real Africa, the hidden Africa, the Africa that very few human beings apart from the Bushmen ever witnessed. Those nights with Jimmy were the most magical of Martine's life. It was rare for the other animals to notice her, and those that did seemed to accept her as an extension of the white giraffe. Safe on Jemmy's high back, she was able to watch baby warthogs play and move close enough to the elephants to touch their parched grooved skin. Once when Jemmy was drinking from a lake as black as ink, she found herself just yards from a party of bubble-blowing hippos. With their tubby bodies, piggy eyes, and tiny ears, hippos were among the cutest creatures in the wild, but they were also the most lethal. Their huge pink jaws could bite boats as well as people in half, and they frequently did. So Martine took special care to stay away and be respectful when she was anywhere near them. I'll include some hippo facts in the comment section. But her favorite thing was to ride the white giraffe up the encarcement where she and Jim Tende had had breakfast, swiveled around so she could use his withers as pillows and then his hindquarters as a footrest. Lie back and gaze at the canopy and stars. They were so clear and, and cold were the nights with summer sliding into autumn that she was able to see the Southern Cross in Orion's belt and even Mars glowing in the navy blue sky. Sometimes she talked to Jemmy about what happened to her, about the night of the fire, how scared and heartbroken she had been, about her mom and dad and how much she would missed them, about school and her struggles to fit in, about the Egyptian, Egyptian goose and the kudu and the strangeness of her gift. Jemmy's ears flicked back and forth and he made this musical fluttering sound and somehow she felt that in his giraffe way he understood everything and she felt comforted. The whistle it turned out worked perfectly. Jemmy always responded to it. Although how long it took depended on where he had been in the reserve. Martine took to wearing the whistle around her neck, even at school, because it made her feel close to Jemmy. It also meant that she didn't have to hunt for it when she went sneaking out late at night. But as much as, much as she missed him, she was very careful to vary the hours when she called him and never do it more than twice a week. She was well aware that each time she went into the reserve, she was taking a risk. Still, she continued to get away with it, and she managed to persuade herself mainly because she wanted more than anything for it to be true that she and Jemmy could go on like this forever. And that's the end of the chapter.